So hello, I'm Catherine Oliver. Um, I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Cambridge in the Department of Geography. I'm currently working on um, Mount Barua's ERC-funded ER, ER, project, Urban Ecologies. Uh, I first gave this talk at the Vital Geographies Research Group uh, seminar series at the University of Cambridge in, um, what month is it? December 2020. And I'm just re-recording it here to share with you. Um, and this is uh, kind of the, the ideas and the project that I'm developing to work on over the next three years. So I'm a geographer. I'm interested broadly in beyond human research. I've worked on historical and contemporary veganism and animal activism, the ethics and politics of interspecies friendship and multi-species ethnographic research, primarily working with ex farm laying chickens. And I finished my PhD in, on veganism and multi-species worlds earlier this year. And my PhD drew together archival research, activist interviews and chicken ethnographies to explore the past, presence and potential futures of veganism in Britain. So my previous multi-species ethnography with rehomed chickens, you're gonna see pictured in this presentation, this is Olive, along with some other uh, images of chickens, rehomed chickens um, and chicken, chickens in industrial situations from We Animals, um, which is a great project that you should check out by Joanne MacArthur. This is all um, images that uh, photographers and artists have taken all over the world of, of animals, um, all kinds of animals in all kinds of locations and scenarios. And these are free to use for animal advocacy purposes. There's also one picture uh, later on in the, um, in the presentation uh, from Mary Britton Clouse's Chicken Run Rescue, which has been a very influential, who's, she's been very influential, her work's very influential on my own, um, and you'll see that pictured uh, later on. So further afield, uh, my other research, I work on feminist geographies, research in the academic conference as a site of disbelonging and the role of friendship in resisting the neoliberal academy. So there's some overlapping themes in my work here. So my work at Cambridge will be with chickens and specifically with uh, backyard chickens in London. And I'm gonna share a broad overview of this in this talk today. So chicken keeping might be understood as a transformative personal collective and worldly endeavor that foregrounds human animal sociability and resists the agricultural industrial complex and has the potential to disrupt anthropocentric flows of the city. So there are two kinds of backyard hens. Rehomed ex farm hens who've been diverted away from slaughter and into the domestic hen keeping space, and specialist breeds of hens. And so far, I've been particularly interested in the former, these rehomed hens. So from 2005 to 2012, 200,000 hens were rehomed in the UK, and 5% of these hens were rehomed in London. This year, uh, about 55,000 hens have been rehomed through uh, one large rehoming organization, which is uh, British Hen Welfare Trust, and they on average rehome 60,000 hens a year, and that's just one organization. So the practice of uh, backyard hen keeping has grown in the face of ecological and environmental crises and the increasing scrutiny of the ethics and implications of eating industrialized animals. In the contemporary British urban space, chickens are usually distanced from humans in life and physically removed from the city. But the rise of urban hen keeping disrupts con constructions of chickens that hold them at a distance and value them only in death. In their ordinariness, chickens as alive, lively co-constitutors of the world have much to offer in not only expanding the urban to attend to non-humans, but refiguring the urban itself from more than human perspectives. So the urban lives of chickens are entangled with complex care for and controls of nature that are implicated beyond the urban space itself in flows into and out of the city. And in my research, I'm gonna primarily be looking at rehome chickens, the people who facilitate rehomings between farms, factories, and the people who rehome these chickens themselves. Ethnographies of chicken in London will hopefully, uh, COVID allowing, take place across two different scenarios. The first will be in collectives, such as urban gardens, allotments, and schools. And the second will be in domestic private spaces. So I'm interested in pursuing a kind of follow the being ethnography beginning either at the rehomers or even the farms if possible, to trace the journeys of chickens from farm to and through rehoming centres and into the city, as well as around the urban space, uh, for example in the informal economies of their eggs. I'm interested in the motivations, flows of logics, as well as the practicalities of the hen rehoming process, to understand what chickens mean and how they live in the city. 
Alongside this, I'm engaging with archival sources and secondary data, which is what I'm doing at the moment, to ask what kinds of scientific, veterinary and vernacular knowledges we have about chickens. Following the practical ethics and philosophy of thinkers like Mary Midgley, I hope to attend with sensitivity to and learn with care from ethology, biology, environmentalists, artists, writers, activists, rehomers and chickens themselves to ensure that this work is rooted in and responsive to the real world. This is a quote from Kid and McKinnell in Science in the Self, which is a book about Mary Midgley. This begs the question, of course, and this is one of the overarching questions of my project, why chickens? So Alice Walker, the author of The uh, Colour Purple, you might know her as, a uh, black feminist novelist, in the opening to the Chicken Chronicles, recalls noticing, as if for the first time, a chicken and her brood crossing the path in front of me. She was industrious and quick, focused and determined. I was stopped in my tra tracks as if I'd never seen a chicken before. But had those chickens been like this one? Why hadn't I noticed? Had I noticed? So in this memoir, Alice Walker chronicles her bond, joy and transforming world when she returns to live with chickens in her adult life after growing up keeping and killing chickens as a child in the deep South America. How is it that this moment of encounter lingered with Walker? What are the socio-cultural, political and spatial qualities of particular interspecies encounters that remain with us and pull us into this parallel world that all the other examples, animals exist in? So having lived with and researched chickens before, oh, sorry. Um, having lived with and researched chickens before, I've recognised these feelings uh, and have shared these feelings of connection with chickens. As I'm going to talk about the end of this presentation, chicken keeping in domestic and urban space has increased and this has further spread up, sped up through the lockdown earlier this year. So the kind of questions that I invite in this project and I'll be thinking through in this work are why chickens? I say why chickens? Um, what is it about these birds that enchants humans? And how is this entangled with not only production, but imaginaries of nature and the urban? Also, what are the histories of chickens and humans in urban space, especially London? What are the scales that we can think with and of the urban chicken through from the cellular to the industrial? And what kinds of methodological ethnographic practices can rethink uh, geography beyond the human? So I'm just gonna talk a little bit about the uh, chicken human histories and chicken human histories of labor, particularly. So chickens as, um, and domestication. So chickens as massified laborers have a long history integrated with human society and development. Gallus gallus domesticus, the domestic fowl, are thought to have multiple origins, the Java, the Ceylon, the jungle gray and the jungle red. Rather than just the jungle red, um, which is the bird that Darwin proposed that domestic chickens were all uh, descended from. It's likely the northern China was one of uh, several regions um, of early ch chicken domestication, and this was as long as 10,000 years ago. Chickens were also domesticated in India at least 3,000, uh, in India around uh, 3,000 BC. In the 4th century BC, Egypt uh, was home to a mass society which mastered the technology of large-scale incubation. This is uh, from Smith and Daniel, 1975. Smith and Daniel argue that undoubtedly in um, Egypt, there was a relationship between the huge labour force, including slave labour force, and the organisation and mass production of food. The incubators that were used were built of clay brick over fires, and these were adjusted by attendants who turned eggs and maintained the correct heat, allowing for up to 10 or 15,000 eggs to be incubated at once. And so this process of keeping the eggs warm and turning them would be what a chicken um, who was set in and hatching her egg, eggs does when the chicks burn their eggs underneath her, she rotates them with her feet and keeps them warm at constant temperature. So the urban assemblage of exploitation, labour, technology and chickens sought to remove the chicken from part of her reproductive process in order that she'd be freed up to lay eggs rather than hatch the chicks. And this was um, since, and this is because, and this is still uh, one of the reasons today, since the productive period of an egg laying for a hen is not much more than two years, to allow a hen to set and hatch her own chicks would to be, use, be to use up a substantial portion of her productive life. So traditionally, egg production has taken most of the gross chicken income in the United States. In 1975, um, broiler chickens overtook egg chickens for the first time, 50% broilers to 48% eggs in industry. And by the end of the 20th century, broiler business was a $22 billion industry, 
with the egg industry in the United States being around $3 billion. Egg consumption dropped from the 1960s to 90s with fears of salmonella, while consumption of chicken meat rose from 23% to 43% of the meat Americans are now eating. And this was mainly in the form of chicken breasts. And something similar is happening in the UK, um, preference for chicken meat over or be traditional animals such as lamb, cow, pig, uh, red meat, I guess you would call it. So Britain's food production system has a global and colonial history, but in contemporary Britain, Brexit has brought industrial chicken farming into the spotlight, with the new agricultural bill offering no guarantees to prevent what are being termed cheap low welfare imports. Particularly gaining airtime is the potential import of chlorinated chicken meat from the US, with concerns over chlorine washing of chickens, uh, which doesn't kill disease, but rather makes this, the disease or um, you know, bacteria undetectable in lab testing, which is a threat to human and avian um, health. So while chicken meat has been the focus of lots of uh, public discussion, welfare issues, uh, these uh, chlorination issues, both academic and publicly, the egg laying chicken has somewhat faded into the background in recent years and often hidden under the guise of happy eggs. The contemporary laying hen has a distinct history and contemporary life of confinement, labour and post-productive use. So because the laying hen's uh, sort of end game or the end, end goal of the egg laying industry isn't for the chicken to be eaten, but to continually lay byproducts or eggs, uh, when this kind of highly efficient productive production machine slows down, and that's, that's kind of how they see it, not how I see it, the chicken poses a problem to capital. So the red jungle fowl from which some domestic hens descend lay 10 to 15 eggs a year in clutches of four to six chicks. It's only with long-term human selective breeding interventions that hens have transformed into egg production machines, um, laying daily where domesticated species are supposedly thriving because as Nick Taylor um, writes, humans have entered into a social contract with these species based on our supposed mutual advantage, i.e. we providing care for them, in return they feed our soil and keep us their flesh. But the reality of this, this supposed social contract for chickens is a relation of physical and psychological turmoil. The broiler chicken and the layer chicken are each the result of long history of fowl breeding and importing according to standards of excellence. Um, one example of this, the kind of preferences for different kinds of birds, the long history of different preferences of different breeding techniques is noted in this quote here from Smith and Daniel. Through biotechnological and genetic manipulation, farmers have been contending with the market increasing productivity whilst providing the cheapest, most nutrient-dense food to control weight and mortality rates. And this, this includes pre-industrialized chicken agriculture. Where the broiler chicken's body converts feed into flesh, which is itself food, the laying chicken's body becomes the waste product or even the byproduct of the egg industry itself. Their bodies have little economic value, not being as fleshy as broilers. And traditionally they are ground up at the end of their productive lives uh, when they're spent they're ground up and either buried or used for spent hen meal, which is fed back to chickens, uh, used in cheap human foods, such as chicken nuggets, baby food, and also used in uh, companion animal or pet food, such as the dogs and cats. However, there are also new utilizations, and that's a kind of scientific or agricultural word for the use of these, um, utilization of ground spent hens emerging, most notably as um, a resource for biofuel, and this is seen as desirable because ground spent hens are cheap. This would divert waste, the, the waste, the, the chickens away from landfill. And it also plays into this imaginary of a circular efficient system of industrialized farming uh, and how this could actually, uh, as we, uh, an industry that's very heavily critiqued for being environmentally damaging, um, kind of playing uh, or buying into this biofuel industry is a sort of a, a green greening attempt, I suppose or could certainly be seen as that. So where these spent hens have traditionally had little value, the making of hens into multiple byproducts, their own bodies becoming byproducts in the byproducts industry, it ekes capital from what has traditionally been a waste product. In her 1964 book, Animal Machines, Ruth Harrison takes on the industrialization of chickens and many other, uh, many other animals. 
And she, she writes, where the absorption into commercial farming turns purely to efficiency and material progress. Life is cheap to the factory farmer. Chickens can be turned out in their millions and are therefore considered a more expendable commodity than larger and more expensive forms of livestock. Where for the broiler hen, metabolic intensification has led to a significantly foreshortened lifespan, reaching their slaughter weight as fast as 50 years ago. For the layer hen, this metabolic and capitalist churn puts demands upon them as laborers, commodities, and capital to produce efficiently by laying at least daily. As Alex Blanchett writes on pigs in his uh, 2020 book, Porkopolis, agribusiness magnifies some evolutionary behavior, such as reproductive instincts, only to radically deny others. Each type of hog, or I would say chicken, is being refined to do only one thing with increasing intensity. And for the chickens, the, the reproductive process is intensified, but the other kind of behaviors and psychological uh, traits around reproductive, uh, so living with cockerels, uh, setting and hatching eggs, the, the, as you can see in this picture, the um, cages that chickens are kept in are on a slant, so the egg rolls away, so the chicken would have no opportunity. They can't nest, they can't produce nesting behaviors, but chickens do attempt to do all these things, even in confinement, and even with um, such little, so, so few resources. In Karen Davis's 2009 book, um, Poisoned Eggs, Prison Chickens, I think it's something, something like that, I can't remember the exact title, it's, it's brilliant in sharing what, what happens and what chickens try and, try and uh, the kind of condition of chickens in confinement. So when the hen comes to the end of her productive uh, industrial life, this is where rehomers intervene. And I'm really interested in understanding why farmers choose this option, what work organisations are doing to convince farmers that this has value, and to trace the flows of chickens into the city. At Fresh Start for Hens, which is a, a rehoming organisation in the UK, they describe the rehoming process um, as such. Uh, firstly, done through a farm team, which trusted volunteers who go to the farms, transfer hens from cages and barns into poultry crates, ready for transportation to collection points all over the country. And these, there's also drivers and driver's mates included in this team, and they assist with loading hens and transporting the, the, uh, the chickens. There are local distribution centres across the country where people collect hens. Uh, in order to rehome a hen, you have to apply with pictures of your land and set up, provide details about yourself, where you live, um, make a donation, which pays the farmer and transportation costs as well. The British Hen Welfare Trust, which is another rehoming organisation that I mentioned earlier, collect from the farm and rehome on the same day to reduce the stress of the chicken and to ensure that they can settle into their kind of new, new space quickly. So this is quite a quick transition from the industrial confined space into the urban space or wherever the chickens are ending up, which has a requirement to have uh, a coop and a free ranging space. So what interests me in particular about the rise of urban hen keeping is at least threefold. First, how the city is cultivated and reshaped to accommodate these birds, which is entangled with imaginaries of the city as an urban barnyard, a reclamation of nature, and interwoven with questions of the housing crisis, climate crisis, and the Anthropocene. So how are people planting us specific species of uh, plants? How are people changing, you know, but building these structures to house hens? How are they protecting hens from predators, such as foxes, buzzards? Um, what kind of curation and cultivation of the city is being done uh, with a multi-species intention? Second, um, I'm interested in the continued expectation of labour that's put upon chickens, rehome chickens, to continue to lay eggs to earn their keep and participate in new exchange relationships, so food and shelter for eggs. And what I'm really interested in and kind of questioning is whether this is a change in intensity um, rather than a change in kind of human-animal relationship. And finally, I'm interested in thinking about what Natalie Osborne calls still possible cities that are located in ruins. So to think about how urban theory and urban strategy might be informed by non-humans, which in turn raises the issue of race, class, gendered, able-bodied access or disbelonging to multi-species space. So who, who gets to live with chickens? Who gets to live with other animals? Who has the space in the city to cultivate these um, these multi-species worlds and who doesn't. 
So to give a kind of example of the things, the, how these uh, things fit together, I'm just going to finish with talking a little bit about what's happened with chickens this year in the face of COVID-19. So through the COVID-19 pandemic and lockdown, humans have been exposed to the threat that the exploitation and eating of animals poses to humanity and public health. It's also become obvious that animals want to and are willing to take up more space. This is Nick Taylor again, 2020. In the midst of all of this, something perhaps unexpected given the zoonotic nature of COVID-19 has happened. People have chosen to live with chickens and other animals in numbers greater than ever before. Since the beginning of lockdown, the British Hen Welfare Trust, who typically rehome 60,000 hens annually, have received unprecedented numbers of rehome requests. The reasons behind this surge are assumed to be twofold by founder Jane Howard. First, that people who've been interested in hen keeping for a long time now have the time to do so. And second, that they presume they'll have access to a supply of fresh eggs in the face of supermarket shortages and the kind of uproar around food shortages, uh, empty supermarket shelves that we saw, saw back in March and April. So Fresh Start for Hens, uh, which is the other nonprofit rehoming organisation I've, I've mentioned a couple of times, they rehome eggs laying hens as pets. And they say they cannot guarantee any one hen will continue to lay and rather look for and try to find safe hens, safe homes, sorry, for chicken retirement. And obviously this idea of pets has all sorts of other stuff going on in what kinds of effective labour, uh, emotional labour chickens might be being asked to do. Prior to 2020 and lockdown, there was already this rise in backyard hen keeping in Britain, I mentioned before, of both ex laying hens and specialised breeds. The rise of rehoming in lockdown um, and the kind of longer rise of rehoming might be understood to constitute a shift in the multi-species politics of urban space in who we're choosing to live with. So might the rise of chicken keeping reveal the desire for human reconnection with animals in the natural world? Or might this uh, kind of growth and popularity raise questions of how these multi-species space, cultivating this urban space, reproduces or transforms the chicken-human relationship by these kind of demanding that chickens still undertake these different kinds of labour to earn their keep and how this is entangled with um, perceived food shortages and uh, a, a kind of severed food supply suggests that there definitely is something going on with um, with kind of uh, in this in this kind of continued human-chicken relationship uh, of labour and production. So in the slow turnover time of capitalism during lockdown, conversations have opened about what is desirable and possible for ecological and environmental recovery after the pandemic. The lockdown has, in some respect, built on and perhaps expedited pre-existing trends in chicken-human relationships, these, these trends to live with chickens. And whilst these spatial and behavioural changes might allow for the building of more equitable and sustainable multi-species worlds, they also demand that we critically engage with these spaces. Uh, asking questions of urban chickens and those who live with uh, urban chickens. Uh, and these kind of questions are, how do and could we relate to animals as food providers? What kind of governance is being exerted over non-human animals and their welfare in urban spaces? And how might the inclusion of chickens in urban multi-species communities ask different questions of urban space and theory? And so these are the kind of questions I'm gonna be thinking about over the next, um, the next couple of years. Uh, and hopefully when I get out to do field work in, in 2021, all being well um, with vaccines and COVID-19, these are the kind of questions that I'm going to be speaking to people about, kind of tra tracing in these flows into and out of and around the city. Um, so think about how, how the future looks, how the present looks for urban multi-species spaces um, and kind of grappling with these questions of why and how are people living with chickens. And so, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end the talk, the presentation here. I'll post some references uh, and a couple of things I've written in the, in the link, in the comments box below. But yeah, I, I hope this has been an interesting insight into the kinds of things I've been thinking about for the last six months, how this is a kind of continuation of my uh, previous work and how this, and what I'll be thinking about for the next couple of years. So yeah, please do comment, share, uh, and let me know what you think. Thank you.